Welcome to This Cultural Moment, a podcast where we talk about following Jesus in the secular, progressive, post-Christian world. I'm John Mark Comer. I pastor a church in downtown Portland, Oregon. I'm here with Mark Sayers, who does the same in Melbourne, Australia. Mark is also a pastor and a teacher and a writer, but what he's best known is cultural commentary. So basically what I do for the next 20 minutes is just interpret Mark to the world. In this next episode, we talk about where the church got a few things right and got a few things wrong when it comes to post-Christian culture. If the third culture is about deconstruction, if it's about questioning all authority, we have to realize that if we're going to do mission and ministry in the third culture, we have to be very aware that we are in danger of being colonized by this culture. In our last episode, we made the point based off of Philip Reef's sociological paradigm of first culture, second culture, third culture, of pre-Christian, Christian or Christianized, and post-Christian culture. So pre-Christian culture is essentially Europe before the gospel of Jesus or the Roman Empire and paganism before the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's Africa before the modern missions movement or even America before the Plymouth Brethren where there's no knowledge of Christ at all, and it's a world steeped in spirituality, often of gods, goddesses, demons, angels, good, evil, malevolent power lurking behind the world. Then you have a, a world that is, that is second culture or Christian or Christianized that is shaped from the ground up by the Christian value system, by the moral and sociopolitical vision of what Jesus called the kingdom of God. And the kingdom, of course, was a sociopolitical vision. It was a vision for how to organize as a society. So you have all these ways in which Western culture, more than any other culture, has been shaped by Christ and by his teachings. And so many of the values that we just assume are human values, whether it be basic human rights, the dignity of life, equality, justice, are actually really Christian values that have had a global historic influence on the West more than anywhere and not so much on the East. And so there's some fascinating commentary and cultural reality there. But then post-Christian culture, which is the moment that we're more living in, especially if you live in a Melbourne or a Portland, but increasingly even if you live in Dallas or middle America because we all have access to the internet, we're all breathing the air of secularism, our political world now, which takes up so much of our mental real estate, is now thoroughly secular. And so increasingly, we're living in this post-Christian culture, and that does not mean that we've moved on and we've left Christian culture behind, but rather post-Christian culture is deconstructionist. It's almost like wanting to tear down the system that we've built as rebellion or reaction against Christian culture, but yet it still wants to carry forward so many of the values of Christian culture. So Mark's line that he used last episode was, it wants the kingdom without the king. Mark, I think there's all sorts of implications of this reality of pre-post-Christian culture for church and how church is done or not done. And now let's transition a little bit from Western kind of religious history to more church history. And let's talk about the last few decades. Would you just kind of overview Leslie Newbegin, who was one of the first kind of Christian thinkers and theologians to point out that we have moved in the West from a Christian or Christianized culture to a post-Christian culture, and that means we need to change how we do church and how, how we follow Jesus. Mm. Yeah, so you really have, you know, from sort of William Carey, you know, who was sort of one of the first missionaries to go to India, and you have this dialogue then between the second culture, which is sort of Christianized Europe and a sort of first culture, you know, where he was in India with, you know, right. a, a very different world of different religious backgrounds. Um and then what you have in the 20th century, and you begin being, I think, the sort of star amongst this, is then missionaries returning home. And they don't return home to the second world Christendom culture right. that, that you know, Europe had been for so long. They return to a world which is secularizing, which uh, New Begin encounters in yeah. returning to 1970s it's Britain. It's more pluralistic. Yeah, so New Begin, he leaves England in 19, we just looked it up, 1936. Mm. He heads over to India and comes back in 1974. Yeah. So imagine England before World War II, mm. in the middle of the 30s, and then you come back and it's like England in the 70s and, you know. Yeah. Billy Idol, and you're just going... Was that before Billy Idol? Uh, Billy Idol's after, right? He's after yeah, that. Yeah. Whatever. Mm-hmm. You're right in the throes of all yeah. all punk rock, like the mm-hmm. whole thing. That's a 
That's a big difference. Totally. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you've got the Sex Pistols on on TV and they're getting thrown off for swearing. You've got, you know, the '60s counter culture now is is been going for yep. some time. It's normative, That's flowing into the mainstream in the 1970s. Um, you've got modernism in in. Britain, you know, sort of affecting government and, you know, it's not Britain as she's been. It's a, it's Britain losing empire. Yeah. And then part of that story, what Newbegin also picks up is it's a globalising world. So I, th- I, I, I think he spoke Bengali and he'd, he'd been in India with Bengali people. He moves back to his, his uh, where he's going to stay in England and he's actually surrounded by people who speak the same right. Indian language. And the dude's a rock star. So just yes. fun fact, he and his wife, the, so the story goes, when they're done, when they retire, and he had to have been pretty old by mm. that point, 1974, they put all of their stuff in two suitcases and rode buses home to England all the way from India. Wow. So, I mean, the dude was a rock star, yes. brilliant intellectual, mm. great writer, great thinker. And I think that just gave him a fresh perspective that a lot of his contemporaries who had stayed in England over the last few decades had lost because Mm. change is slow and incremental, that, oh, my gosh, we are living in a very different cultural moment. Yes. And I think he just was the first to point out that I just spent the last few decades in India, which was very few followers of Jesus, and now I'm back in England, and it's not that different. But how we do church in England is radically different than how we do church in Mm. India and how Mm. we think about faith in society in England or in the West was still very different than in, say, India. Totally. So it's this, all of a sudden, you know, Newbegin, I think, is, is naming the fact that we're living in this very different environment, which he then starts to sort of identify for others as a mission field. I mean, this is, I remember seeing uh, this, this clip on YouTube um, about a year ago where it was done in the 1970s and it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who was, you know, this sort of stalwart of evangelicalism, Welsh preacher. Yep. And he's on a in talk London, show. In London, right? Yes, yes. In London, you know, had this whole ministry and he's on a talk show and there's sort of the classic 1970s attractive woman host and he's talking. Everything he's saying is fantastic. Everything he's saying I agree with and filled with wisdom and she's just looking at him like he's just landed from Mars. And all of a sudden, it's just at cross purposes. So, you know, faithful biblical truth, but then in this new cultural context where it is like, it feels like it's talking to someone in Papua New Guinea. Right. Um, so it feels like you're talking to, you know, from second world to first world. So Newbegin starts to apply, I guess, the sort of worldview or a framework of a missionary. Uh, a missionary. And I think Newbegin is, is right at this point. The West is a new kind of mission field. But the real question is, what kind of mission field is it? And, and what that's kind where of, maybe yes. he missed it. Yeah. yeah. So he's right to say, hey, we need to think like a missionary, like the way that I did when I went to India in the 30s. Mm. We need to think that way about a London, yes. about a Portland, about our city yes. now. So I think, I think actually he doesn't miss it as much as perhaps others do did miss it. So you've also have in the United States a similar thing happening where you have guys like Donald McGavran and and and, and um, Peter Wagner then coming back, particularly in you know, a Fuller School of... Which uh, for those of you who don't know, were two kind of leading influencers out of Fuller Seminary yes, down yes. in California, one of the yes. kind of top seminaries in the US who started the whole kind of church growth yes. movement. But they kind of started with research, am I right? Yeah. So they, so they sort of start looking at... I think what, really what they do is they come back with a similar view that the West is now not going to be sort of reached or actually well, A, needs to be reached and B, isn't a Christendom culture anymore. That and, it, and these for us are like, yeah, of course. But at yes. the time, this was a brand new idea totally. to think of yourself as a missionary to a city in America. Totally. And so they sort of take the very pragmatic stream that have been in American evangelicalism right back to the sort of, you know, frontier preachers yeah, in the West. Great Awakening. Um, yeah. You know, all that stuff. But then they sort of, you know, apply that, you know, missionary lens to it. Um, and so that you find the church then starting to reincarnate itself into forms that, uh, you know, like, so for example, you know, if, if you go to, um, again, Papua New Guinea, you know, you might begin to use the cultural forms of the culture. You're not wanting to colonize it. So you're not wanting to make everyone in, in you know, one of the great critiques of, of uh, missionary work is that it sometimes holds hands with colonization. Right. So I think this... So, for example, you know, when I'll sometimes visit Uganda, where my daughter is from, or a country in Africa, you go to church... And there's people dressed in suits and ties mm. singing a hymn from a dead white person in England. And yes. you think this is not culturally contextualized yes. to Africa. Absolutely. So you don't want to do that. And I think the science of missiology is you know, been really, you know, tried to not, you know, to think about this and reflect about it, to not do that. So then that, that thought's brought to the West. 
And, you know, what are the forms in the West that we can use? So you start to see, you know, people looking at business, marketing. Yep, the entrepreneurial, missional entrepreneurial kind of thing. So, you know, this idea then that we can sort of reach the West um, by approaching as a mission field has elements of truth, but then there's also some elements where I think it starts to get it wrong. And so this is what has come to be called the missional movement, and a lot of people point to Newbegin as the father of the missional movement, then it spreads to America, you have Fuller Seminary, then in your own country you have Alan Hirsch and others that play a key role in kind of giving language to this idea of a, a new kind of church that takes on the cultural for- forms of our cultural moment. And so for a lot of it, it was have a church in a pub, right? Yeah. And, you know, get outside of the Sunday singing, church building kind of thing mm. and get into the context. But yeah. what you point out so well is that in doing so, it got confused between pre-Christian culture and the dangers there and post-Christian culture and the dangers there. Talk us, talk to us about the yeah. difference. Well, I mean, first of all, you know, this is my roots. So, you know, like I... You know, as a teenager, don't have any Christian friends, come to faith, you know, grew up in a Christian family, but I just don't have any Christian friends. I don't relate to, you know, the, the Christian culture it felt at that time. You know, I listen to different music and all that. So, like, I start to go, you know, how do you do a kind of church that incarnates, to use missionary language, uh, into the culture of my friends, into yeah. what I see in Melbourne. Just you know. like if you were thinking about, you know, 200 years ago, you're exactly. a missionary to Africa for the first time, they'd never heard of Jesus. How do you do church, you know, yes. in that kind of a culture? You started thinking that way about Melbourne in the 90s. Yes. So, you know, Gen X culture was hitting and there's a lot of talk about that and postmodernism was hitting and there's books about that. And so, you know, the question is, okay, well, how do we incarnate into postmodern or Gen X culture? And, um, you know, I started, I planted this, this congregation and we didn't have singing, we didn't have sermons, it was conversation, you know, clips from The Simpsons, we didn't have a front, you know, I was very much influenced by some of the alternative worship stuff yep. that was happening Sitting in the UK. Around. Yep. Totally. And so it was this attempt to then use the cultural forms. I was using the framework of missiology. But the thing that I missed was that there was an assumption that if you did this and you just did mission, that then it would re-energize Christians, it would bring alive their faith, and it would sort of bring the church back to its core purpose. Now, I do believe that mission is one of the core purposes of the church, but the model then of the three cultures is the idea that the third culture actually is not a pre-Christian culture. So it's not we go from one, a pre-Christian culture, then two, sort of a Christianized Christendom culture, and then now we return back to culture one. Yeah, that's not it. That's not an option. Exactly. That What it is is actually we're turning to culture three, which can look tribal, it can look pagan, but it's not. What it is is a a culture that's defining itself against Christianity, wants some of the fruits of Christianity, whether it knows that or not, you know, consciously, and therefore has a, a, a corrosive and caustic effect. So... The science of missiology taught people in in Christian culture not to colonize people in culture one when they're communicating the gospel to them. But what I realized was happening was that as I was in culture two, incarnating and using cultural forms to speak to culture three, a post-Christian culture, that it was colonizing us. Okay, so let me, this is huge. And I think the idea that you're getting at has so many implications for church, for life, for following Jesus. You're saying, let me make sure I hear you right. That if you're coming from a Christian or a Christianized culture to a pre-Christian culture, so say you're a missionary from England in 1894 to, you know, Uganda, I think it was called Rhodesia or whatever it was called at the time, or today you go as a missionary to somewhere in the Muslim world or to Indonesia, somewhere like that, the danger is that you colonize the culture. Yes. That as you bring the gospel of Jesus, you also bring American values, how we dress, how we eat our moral, our political, our whatever values that may or may not line up with the way of Jesus, and you colonize the culture in ways that don't celebrate the good and the beautiful and the true in that culture. The danger if you're coming from a Christian or a Christianized culture to a post-Christian culture, which is a Portland, which is most of America right now, which is 2017 across the Western world, is actually very different. The danger is not that you colonize. The danger is that you are colonized by the culture, that you go out with the gospel of Jesus, and instead of influence, you are influenced. You actually yes. are, instead of shaping, you are shaped. There are all sorts of implications for this. So am I hearing you right? Is that kind of the right, That's right yes. synopsis? I think, you know, you had your experience in the missional movement earlier than me, and then I came into it later. 
I was leading a mega church, and I started to realize, man, we're moving so many people from other churches here. And what we call church growth isn't thousands of people coming to faith in Jesus for the first time. It's people coming from another church. And I started to realize there's all these people in our city. It doesn't care how good, they don't care how good our music exactly. is or if my sermon is cool or if we promote the series on social media. They are not going to set foot in our church. And so we came across the very obvious realization that we need to take a missionary posture toward our city and we need to take the gospel to the city because the city doesn't want to come to our Sunday church gathering thing. And that's great. I still believe in that. But we ran hard after what we called missional community, which was a a way of doing church that spread across the West now for about five years. And we came to that hard conclusion that it was cart before the horse. It wasn't a bad idea. It was a great idea. But so many people ended up going out into the pub, into the bar, into the park, whatever. And rather than like spreading the gospel of Jesus, they were colonized. And we lost as many people as we gained to the city. That was our experience. Oh, and we were very similar. You know, I remember one um, young woman saying to me, you know, who's involved with what we're doing, you know, I went to the pub to to make them more like Jesus and all that's happened is I became more like the people at the pub. And if the third culture is about deconstruction, if it's about questioning all authority, if it's about a sort of, you know, individualized view of the world, highly individualized that, you know, we were joking in the last podcast about how it's great coffee, it's 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 alluring. You know, yeah, it's it's Babylon. There's um, a reason that we feel this gravitational pull totally. to the city, to the culture, because if you're on the right, there's so much socioeconomic disparity right now. But mm. if you're on the right side of it, if you're in Portland or I was just mm. in your city, your city is Shangri-La. If you're mm. at the right part of the world, then it's it's pretty great. Totally. So what we have to realize that if we're going to do mission and ministry in the third culture, we have to be very aware that we are in danger of being colonized by this culture. Now, of course, this has all sorts of implications for how we follow Jesus, how we set up church in the West, how we share the gospel of Jesus, and we're out of time. So we'll talk about it in our next episode. Thanks for listening so much to this cultural moment. If you get a chance, please share a link with your family or friends. We're a brand new podcast just getting started. If you like it, spread the love. And if you get a second, write a review on iTunes. That would help a ton. Thanks a lot. See you next time.